Friday, Baylor College of Medicine and friends of Baylor. Well, the excitement never ends. We love the Olympics because it was five rings and five COVID. So you're wondering, I'm sure, who won. I mean, that's everybody's doing a medal count every day. And you may not realize that Australia just killed it this time. 44 athletes and staff tested positive for COVID. Uh, yet, uh, Zach Stubbley Cook, who won the silver medal in the men's 200 breaststroke, and Lanny Pollister, who won gold in the 4x200, all tested positive. Uh, the German decathlete, uh, decathlete Manuel Idle uh, tested positive. Malta swimmer Sasha Bat. And Britain's uh, swimmer Adam Patey, who won a silver in the men's 100 breaststroke. And of course, our own, very proud of Noah Lyles, who got the uh, bronze in the 200 millimeter. Uh, 200 millimeter. <laughs> that would be a very fast rate. The 200 millimeters, over. It's 200 meter. So I got a lot of questions like, was that appropriate? Because he was. Uh, you know, he was COVID positive. Well, the first thing is it's amazing. He won 100 meters. But think about it. Here's a guy with asthma and COVID running the 200 uh, meters, and he actually got a bronze medal. So he's a, he's a hell of a runner. And besides, he was the best, you know, 200 meter guy in the entire world for many, many, many years. So uh, the only problem with the uh, way it was handled, if you look, here's a cluster of people after he finished the race, and you'll notice none of them are wearing masks. And they should have been. So I don't. I think it was okay for him to run, but it was kind of stupid that they didn't, you know, think about having the medical people around him have masks. Uh, COVID is surging in the in the summer. We've been talking about it for the last few months. Uh, it's having a summer surge. The early uh, leading indicators: the test positivity is up by 17 percent. Emergency room visits up by two and a half percent. And of course, the lagging indicators of hospitalizations are up 3%, and people actually dying from this now 1.5%. So big summer surge in the United States, and of course, also in Europe. And normally, I like to show you the, um, the way they're related beforehand, but I, I mean after, but I'm going to show you beforehand because uh, I want you to see the evolution of the virus in the United States and then from people coming in. So if you'll recall, in 2022, Omicron arrived and was the dominant strain. And the vaccine that was developed was to the XBB 1.5 strain down here. Uh, in 2023, we were all worried because that uh, BA 2.86 that arrived from Denmark took one mutation, turned into JN1, and JN1 was the dominant strain in all of 2023. And then we chugged along all happy until 2024 showed up with the famous FLIRT variants. FLIRT standing for FL, which is an abbreviation for phenanine to leucine change, and R and T, arginine to threonine, in the spike protein that suddenly made it all infectious again. So with lagging immunity from the 23 stuff in the vaccines and the evolution of the virus, all of a sudden we have outbreaks. So this is the United States, and it's kind of amazing if you see how quickly evolution of these viruses happened. J and one virtually disappeared over the summer and is replaced by these flirt variants. And that's what the major thing is. I told you before about traveler-based surveillance. That's all the airplanes coming into eight different uh, airports, as well as the airport uh, wastewater analysis. And what's interesting is you can see JN1 is still persisting in the people coming in from outside of the United States, which strongly suggests that the flirt variants really are evolving faster in the US than in the rest of the, the country. Now. This has, of course, led to a lot of publications. Why, why in the summer, when we're used to having winter viruses, why in the summer are we having this giant COVID surge? And it's not 100% clear. There's some really interesting work from our wastewater group that shows that there's clearly cyclic variation, annual variation based on seasons uh, with all these vi respiratory viruses. But it's in interesting that COVID uh, is really having a surge in the US. So what are the possibilities? Uh, some people have suggested the rising temperature is better for the viral survival. Uh, some people think it might be because we're having more gatherings. Uh, my sense is it's probably that, this, the, that, that we have a uh, waning uh, uh, immunity and surging variants, and that that's the cycle. Our immunity wanes and variants come up. That, that's my opinion. Very little data for that. Uh, but I think that's right. And, and then some people have said, well, in the, it emerges in the South. Because of it's so hot, air conditioning, people get gathered together indoors to watch the Olympics or whatever. If you look at the map for where there's very high levels of COVID, however, it is true that it's much in the south, but it's also in the northwest. And I don't know what 
Minnesota's doing there if it's also in the South. But so I don't think we know. I don't think we know. My guess is I think I'm right. I think it's because wherever there's waning immunity and evolution of the virus, uh, you have a surge. So let's do a quick. Everybody asked me about vaccines. When am I going to get vaccinated? So let's talk about that. Unfortunately, if I if the vaccines were available now, I would be getting vaccinated right now. But there's still the XBB 1.5. So the new vaccines to the variants that are now, we're talking about either the JN1 or the FLIRT variants, won't be available until September and October. And the minute they're available, I'd get a vaccination. In fact, I'd, even if they're not available, I'd get a vaccination. I'd just go get a vaccination. Uh, the flu vaccines, of course, we know that, that usually that season is usually in the winter, usually uh, emerges in sort of October, November, peaks in December. Uh, th so the, this year, we already know that there's going to be a trivalent vaccine based on, remember, I've been showing you the wastewater analysis and what the flu varieties were last year. So we're going to have a trivalent vaccine with H1N1, which was the dominant influenza A this past year, H3N2, which was kind of a surprise but showed up, and so that's going to be part of the next year's vaccine. And the B strain, Victoria. Remember, Yamagata uh, didn't even show up last year. So RSV vaccines, uh, I got my RSV vaccine. Uh, what they're recommending is if you haven't gotten one and you're over the age of 75, you should definitely get one. Uh, between the ages of 60 and 74, if you're at risk, you should probably get one. But if you've had an RSV vaccine, there's no evidence that you need another one. So. There was one study that said, can you get the flu uh, and RSV vaccine safely uh, together? And the answer is yes. There is no problem with getting both vaccines. So if you get, when you get your flu shot, if you haven't gotten an RSV and you're over the age of 75 or over the age of 60 with any kind of risk factor, get your RSV. It's not enough to have COVID, <laughs> flu. <laughs> Mpox, is, we, Mpox is back. You remember we were talking about monkeypox for a while? So the Mpox is a monkeypox virus. It's part of the same family of viruses that cause smallpox. And what you usually get is a rash and symptoms like fever, headache. Uh, the rash goes through a number of uh, stages. First, it's a diffuse rash. Then there's some uh, pores that form or scabs that form. And usually you recover from it. It's a zoonotic disease start in Africa that spreads between animals and people. Usually it's in small rodents and monkeys and other mammals. The very first case of Mpox in a man was, was in a person was 1970 in what is now the Democratic Republic of Congo, DRC. Uh, then what happened in, 19, in, uh, 19, in 2022 was it spread around the world, became a big issue. Uh, before that, it was very, very rare to see. Uh, it was just really endemic in Africa. So there are two types of monkeypox. There's the one that's pretty severe in Central Africa, and then there's one that's less severe uh, in West Africa. The one that was less severe is the one that spread around in 2022. But the CDC just uh, issued an alert because there have been a number of the more severe monkeypox cases reported in Central Africa. That's the first type. And cases rose to by 160 uh, percent last year. Uh, 461 people have already died from it this year. And it's bad. It's all in DRC in the Democratic Republic of Congo but it's beginning to spread to other countries, including Burundi, Rwanda, and Uganda. So the concern is that if it begins to spread like that, it might spread to other places in the country. And the reason for us to be concerned about it and for the CDC to uh, issue an alert is so that physicians are aware that if someone shows up with a fever and a rash, it could be monkeypox. So if you're not worried about life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, you can also worry about monkeypox. But that's not enough because we have bird flu, H5N1, avian flu. So a avian flu is really, we have a cumulative surveillance. There's been 14 cases since 2022 in the United States. Four were in those dairy cows that we talked about in Dallas, or in Texas. 10 were in poultry cases, and nine of the 14 cases have been confirmed to definitely be avian flu, H5N1. Now, 14 cases in humans, not so bad. Wild birds, 97, uh, 9,715. 100 million poultry affected, 189 dairy herds affected. So it's a big issue right now. And we talked about transmission from milk. As long as it's pasteurized, okay. If it's unpasteurized milk, you should be very, very careful, particularly in regions that have had H5N1. There's some good news. It's the CDC has been sequencing nine of the 14 cases, and they all 
are consistently the same avian genetic uh, material. Uh, it's, there's nothing that shows an adaptation to mammals. There's nothing that shows a mutation that would increase severity. So right now, it still appears in very small number of people who are uh, taking care of either poultry workers or, or uh, taking care of dairy. So we're worried about it. We're following it. But it hasn't broken out into a big deal. But West Nile virus is booming also this summer. West Nile symptoms are really uh, uh, not too bad, but let me, let me show you first. It's carried by the common uh, mosquito. Uh, there are other two very nasty mosquitoes that carry dengue and yellow fever, the Aedes albopictus and Aedes aegypti. Aedes aegypti, is, uh, th these two uh, carry dengue and yellow fever. The big concern of this tiger mosquito, the Aedes uh, albopictus, is that it's spreading through Europe. And so this was the big concern during the Olympics that France, because this, this mosquito is present, might have a big dengue outbreak. So the only good thing about ending, them, <laughs> ending the current Olympics is that nobody got dengue. We're worried, of course, the Paralympics are going on, so there's still a lot of concern. Well, let's get back to West Nile, carried by the common mosquito. Most people are asymptomatic. Eight out of 10 people don't even know they had it. About one in five get a febrile illness. About one in 150 or so develop a pretty severe illness that causes central nervous involvement. And that's where you get an encephalitis. So, and it's more common in elderly. I've known people who, elderly people who've gotten West Nile and had an encephalitis. And one out of 10 of those people actually die from the disease. So it can be a very severe disease. Uh, we are monitoring closely. So far, the CDC has reported 174 cases in 2024 113 are neuroinvasive. The, re the reason it seems like a higher percentage is because there's, a, I'm sure, a bunch of people that have been uh, in, bitten and infected who are asymptomatic. And 30 states are showing it. It's interesting, if you look at the United States, this is where it's dark blue, those are cases of West Nile. You can see mostly it's in the south because the mosquito transmission is, better, is worse there, or the mosquitoes are worse, and so there's more transmission. In the north, most of those cases are from a uh, transfusion. So people who've been infected and then got transfused, not necessarily because of a mosquito bite. But wait, there's more. We're having a giant outbreak in Texas. Huge number of cases in Dallas and in Houston. And so far, we have reported 23 people tested positive in our own county, Harris County. So 23 people, 615 mosquitoes have tested positive. I don't know, they, they came in to the clinic and were, had their blood drawn and were found to be positive. And 27 dead birds have tested positive. So we're having a big outbreak, which leads to aerial spraying. So we're now doing aerial spraying uh, in the counties that are infected, mostly in Harris County in the north. Uh, and just remember, if you have a pot in the back, or you know, not that many people have spare tires lying around, but if you do, empty those. If you have pot plant holders with a base that has a little thing of water, be sure you, to empty those, because you gotta just practice Reasonable mosquito control, wear longer sleeves at night, use DEET. Okay, I want to end today. I mean, that's enough. I'm exhausted. <laughs> There's so much infectious disease. I need a vacation. Anyway, uh, except where I'm going to go to where there are mosquitoes, so I'm not doing that. Uh, I want to end today with some shout outs. So, over the summer, we welcomed all of our new students. So, summer is a great time, you know, for vacations, but all the graduate students and the medical students all show up around July 1st. And so, uh, welcome everybody to both our Houston and our Temple campuses. Big shout out to Nick Hamania, pulmonary critical and sleep uh, medicine, who was named the 2024 Distinguished Chest Educator by the American College of Chest Physicians. That's a really great honor. Places among the top 3% of chest faculty worldwide. Uh, so congratulations, Dr. Hanania. And then finally, Dr. Mary Healy, uh, Associate Professor of Pediatrics and Infectious Disease, was named to be the co-director of Clinical Operations Unit of the Infectious Disease Clinical Research Consortium, a clinical trials network of the NIH Institute of Allergy and Infectious Disease. She joins Baylor's Dr. Robert Atmar as co-director of the unit to provide operational support, management, and oversight of the group's clinical research portfolio. And for those of you wondering, uh, Lily is now on vacation in Greece. <laughs>